I am very honoured to be here tonight uh, to give this public lecture in honour of a man who has left a legacy which endures not just here but internationally. Uh, I was a Canterbury University law student and in in thus graduate after a while and I always considered the engineering school one of the jewels in the crown uh, of this university. This is a most exacting profession uh, on which we all rely and we have to trust. And it's despite the fact that you engineers work in such an exacting profession that you have to live with the fact that opinions about what you do are contestable and your methods are contestable and your opinions are contestable and your standards are those that you follow but debate and prove and change all the time. My engineering experience is limited to my professional life, but the topic I'm addressing tonight transcends engineering into all fields of endeavour, all professions and all workplaces. The Royal Commission into the Earthquakes in Christchurch reported on many technical issues, but the Royal Commission report in Pike River addressed another issue in an emphatic way which applies as much to engineering as to law as to any workplace in New Zealand. And that is in the heartfelt and straightforward recommendation and statement that apart from the technical changes that were required in mining, there had to be an attitudinal change in the way workplaces and in particular hazardous workplaces are conducted and the investigation of risk. The thesis of what I'm talking about tonight, taken from Pike River and two years of engagement, is that I consider Pike a metaphor for human failure at many levels. The response to the Royal Commission report has been swift by the government. How could it not be, given the failure of the agencies of government and the legislators who brought down a system of health and safety which failed uh, so dramatically at Pike River. In a sense, Pike River was the crystallisation of a setting created by legislation which came into force in 1992. But time consigns victims and families to faded public memory, and it's the raw wounds of shock and loss that drive change. If the response is swift, it must be sound and enduring. Yet we have not responded in the past. How many of you knew or know that New Zealand's health and safety record is inferior to that of other comparable countries? The workplace fatality rate is higher than the United Kingdom, Australia and Canada, worse than the OECD average and remains static in recent years. And how many of you know this roll call of the major fatalities in New Zealand mines? 1879 Kaitangata. 34. 1896, Brunner, 64. 1914, Ralph's Colliery, 43. 39, Huntley, 11. 1967, Strongman, 19. And I deliberately didn't say after each of those numerics, men, deaths or whatever, because the way these matters are reported and our history reads, they're numbers. But they're not numbers, they're people. And my thesis uh, really is summed up in this expression from the Royal Commission. Lessons from the past, learned at the cost of lives, have not been retained. The consequences of health and safety failure are simply overwhelming. These men are not statistics. They must be remembered for who they were and are, and their families, for the loss they have suffered. And then look around us, look around this room and contemplate the fact that we have a living everyday responsibility in the workplace to others, to ourselves, to our families, to protect one another. Because this is what went wrong at Pike River. I want to pay a tribute to the families and those who are here tonight. And because there are many families not here tonight, it is wrong to name them uh, uh, one by one. 
I want to acknowledge Bernie Monk, however, who's somewhere in the audience tonight, who you know as now a public figure, but who carried the burden for the families over uh, the whole time from the 19th of November 2010 and even today. And I want to add something else, that the public of New Zealand have not seen the body lying in the Pike River mine. We have, the Prime Minister has seen it, and so have the courts and the inquest. It is as if I lay on the ground now. It is an intact body, undamaged despite four explosions, lying quietly in a part of the mine which we were told for the families would have been destroyed uh, com comprehensively by four explosions. It is not. There was a body, and there will be other bodies, and they're entire in parts of the mine. And I say that because so many of the families have had to suffer the res response from many of the public to say, let it go. It's very difficult when 80 metres below where you stand, there may be the man you left behind. So I'd ask you to do this um, because statistics <coughs> do not tell the story. I'd ask you to look very closely at the faces of the men on the screen. You've probably looked at them as a group in newspapers. But look at the faces and look at the ages. From 17 by one day to 62. A 45 year span of work force. And have a good look to see what you read into those faces because we came to know them and to understand uh, their personalities, the people they were. And they cannot fade from the public memory because these are people who paid a sacrifice they should never have paid. And so have their families. And I'm going to ask for your indulgence now to have something read by one of the family's members. It's something that I have read for the families at other presentations. But tonight I want, I'm going to ask what I call Anna's story be read to you for a few minutes by Anna Osborne, who lost her husband and partner Milton, or Milt Osborne, at Pike River. Anna? My name is Anna Osborne. I live in Nahiri on the west coast of the South Island with my two children, Robin and Alicia. I pondered over how I could possibly express in words the total sense of loss I feel after losing Milton, my darling husband of 18 years, to the Pike River Mine disaster, along with the effects and impact it has had on me and our two teenage children. My immense sadness, deep sorrow, <coughs> complete emptiness and total devastation I felt and continue to feel after my world changed forever back in November 2010 has been hard to deal with. I have been unable to hold a memorial service as yet as I feel I would be doing Milt a huge injustice if I didn't fight to bring him home. I still don't believe it. I keep asking why. Why me? Why us? Why those men who became known as the Pike 29? It is something you've paid to see at movies, not something that happens to us in real life. Not something you would, um, that would devastate our lives of so, uh, of so many people. Milton and I have been together for 19 wonderful years, 18 of those as husband and wife. We were best friends. We shared a very special bond that I will always be grateful for. We loved each other immensely, and life couldn't have been more perfect when we celebrated the birth of our two wonderful children who were 15 and 13 at the time, at the time of their father's death. Milton was always there for the kids and I. He was proud to be the breadwinner of our family. He was quite an old-fashioned guy in many ways. Times were always tough money-wise, but the benefits outweighed any financial difficulties. Not only did the children and I rely on Milt, but so did so many people in our community. Milton was a Deputy Fire Chief Officer of the Nahiri Volunteer Fire Brigade for 17 years. He was in his second term as a Great District Councillor. He was the Deputy Chairperson on the School Board of Trustees for nine years. He was a member of the Nahiri Community Services. 
He trained people in fire safety. He would help the elderly in our community and always turn up for working bees that happened in and around our district. All this is lost now. Milton always walked side by side with me, regardless of how extreme things got at times. In February 2010, I was diagnosed with reoccurring Hodgkin's lymphoma after being in remission for eight years. Not long before the explosion in October 2010, I was hospitalised for eight days due to an infection which surrounded the tumour. I was very ill and required much, sorry, much care which Milt provided. I said to Milt I needed him to be there for the children should my fight against the cancer fail. I was 44 years old at the time. Milt reassured me that he'd be there for our kids and that he would always be here for me. He told me that I'd beaten it before and I'd beat it again. I just had to remain positive and believe. I still live with Hodgkin's lymphoma today. I am monitored very closely. With Milton no longer able to support me through these difficult times, and while I recuperate from my operations to come, it will affect my children and I financially, as no money will be coming in. Physically and mentally, I will struggle without milk by my side. Milton's contract at Pike was an opportunity for us to finally have some money in the bank. We were never, we'd never really had a lot, but we were happy in our lives and with each other. We wanted to save for a holiday. We'd never had a holiday as such, as milk worked all the time. We also wanted to do renovations on our house. <clears throat> milk was our main income earner. I work part time, which brings in enough to keep the balls from the door, just. Without the generosity of the public, getting through these few last three years financially would have been impossible, and I am so grateful. I worry about not being able to support my children with their schooling and university needs and costs. I want to give them a bright future, just like their father would have wanted. Milton was always too proud to ask for a handout. He worked and paid his taxes from the age of 14. He was proud to be able to support his family. It was a man's job, according to him. I know the impact on my children and the toll on me. My children have seen their mother go from a happy, posi positive, easy-go-lucky person to a very different person. I suffer from anxiety and would rather not leave home. I always felt confident with milk by my side. When I need to go to town, it is with a painted smile on my face. Pretending to others that I am okay is something I quite often do. At home behind closed doors, I crumble. Milt was my rock. I miss him more than words can say. He was my reason for getting up in the morning and starting the day. He was the love of my life, who loved me despite of all my ailments and imperfections. My children are the true victims in all of this. Losing their precious dad has affected them in so many ways. If Milton wasn't working, he would be doing something with the kids. My son was his father's shadow. He would follow his father everywhere and do all the things his daddy did. My children miss his knowledge, his wit, his presence, his support, his guidance, his love, his laughter, his fun, a father figure. I thank God my kids had these wonderful opportunities with their dad. He taught them to fish, to hunt, to cook, to take care of themselves and never give up on a task. It is so sad to think that my husband will never be able to walk his daughter down the aisle on her wedding day. That he won't be around to see her children grow up, leave home and start new lives of their own. Maybe one day become a grandparent. I can't believe Pike changed our worlds in the blink of an eye. This disaster could have and should have been avoided if only the people employed in positions to know better had done their jobs properly. So many people at so many levels failed our guys and destroyed our worlds and our hearts have been permanently broken. Every working person in this country has the right to arrive safely at work each day, feel safe and continue to be safe at the end of their shift and return home to their loved ones. This could no longer be a given. I should have grown old with a man that made me complete. Thank you. So when we talk about numbers, we think about people like Anna and Milt. And I have been surprised as I've given presentations around New Zealand 
at the response often from health and safety professionals who have been trained academically, who have never confronted the kind of outcomes you've just heard and had to face the reality of the failures that can attend every workplace. I am not a speak an expert, so I speak as an observer. I worked in dangerous places to pay for my education. I was lucky in that generational opportunity. But over 40 years in legal practice, I have been involved in many cases where things have gone so dreadfully, dreadfully wrong. It struck me, and it's the thesis I wish to address tonight, that much of Pike's story was peculiar, peculiar to mining, but the behaviour and performance of individuals and the company's culture was relevant to all workplaces, including this university. It is part of my thesis that the search for fault and its attribution leads to misunderstanding the event and allows a person to be scapegoated for what occurred. When the underlying causes lie fallow, to rise up and strike again and again and generationally again. I believe there's a central core proposition that we have to reflect on in the workplace, whether we work for somebody or we control in some way that workplace. And that is this. We must ask the extent to which we can rely on others, can rely on others, and secondly, and even more important, the extent to which others can rely on us. The concept of mutuality, I find, in learning about these, a disaster such as Pike, is sadly lacking. That there is a two-way street of responsibility between, at all levels, in a workforce, because there are levels where there is no concept that one person is, um, is as important as another, as everybody else. And that lack of mutuality leads to a lack of respect and a lack of self-respect in ways I'll come to. Human response is intrinsic in all our lives, and every workplace has some resonance to propositions which seem so trite that we don't think about them. And most employers don't give this much thought. But the core elements of culture, apart from the technical expertise with which we conduct, for example, an engineering a proposition, a task, a mine, these core elements of culture must be present. There must be respect for leadership. And that means, in that tough, self-examined area of leadership, the leadership must deserve respect and gain it. There must be respect for the systems in place, where at Pike the systems were dramatically below standard in so many ways to which I refer. There must be belief in excellence of the work that every person is doing, belief by that person, even where a job may be thought mundane, no one should be left with a sense of unimportance. There must be recognition of the need for constancy and adherence to the principles of, under which the workplace operates. There must be availability of safe recourse when there is concern of whatever nature. Not just the whistleblower, but an open culture in which you can express your views and concerns to someone who will listen. There must be instilled a sense of involvement and really good humour in the workplace, and there must be belief that our workplace is a good place to go every day. And if we listen to the workplace and think now of your own workplaces, and if you really knew what's being said about the place that you work by the people who work there, and if you have responsibility for these people, think about these words, and this is just a very lightly salted dose of what some of the men at Pike River who died said to their families and are recorded in this way through the mouths of the families who survived. They're all different, different men. He hated the work, the conditions and the general disorder of the place. There seemed to be no communication between the people at the top. He worked as a painter and decorator and handyman for most of his life. He worked in a retail firewood and coal yard in Greymouth. He had, had no previous underground experience and had been at Pike River for three months. The worst mine he'd ever worked in, it was not just about safety, but everything was always broken down. Had asked advice about what to do about the safety issues at Pike River, he was so concerned. Just got on with the job, whatever he did, whatever it was. He was quite a tough man and he liked the toughest of the jobs and the risks involved. One worker went in to do overtime 
because he was so worried about the pressure his boss was under. This boss was so exhausted he was sleeping, standing up underground. The men were individuals and not team players, and that's the men across the entire workforce at the mine. So if you ask the question in your workplace and look around, and there's your colleague over here, what's your colleague thinking about the place he or she works? And what do you really think about it yourself in terms of the safety of the environment in which you're working? The fact is that the government response to Pike has addressed in really quite a, an astonishing way to me many of the technical failures uh, that existed in the system of a mine such as Pike River very quickly. And I think the families, while not experts in their own right, nor am I, sense a determination by people of great goodwill and high, high school levels to return New Zealand to something that it was 20 years ago, before we adopted an ideological construct of the workplace which, in my view, has led to Pike River. The 1992 Health and Safety, Safety and Employment Act and its ideological origins, in my view, have a huge amount to do with what happened at Pike and may resonate with some of the other seeming surprises in New Zealand when things suddenly go so dramatically wrong, with or without fatalities. So I think that some of the tensions and the culture within the workplace at Pike could be found, for example, in a law practice. My experience of law practice in other professions is that particularly in big legal firms, <coughs> is that they can be brutal in the expectations of people. Without the obvious manifestations of death in a violent way such as at Pike, but they have their more insidious risks of mental stress, failure and breakdown, physical or mental. The lessons of Pike carry across all workplaces. And when the young man in the finance industry died in Europe this week, after three days without sleep and working for that period, I was astonished that part of the response was, if this is what happened, because we did not know why he died, but the attribution is three days without <coughs> sleep, if that is possible, is that that's what young people do in this industry. They like clocking up the miles. It's a cultural challenge for them and something to brag about. And immediately, instilled with the, if you like, the politics and my own ideology of after Pike, I thought, well, hang on, how, how could the employer allow that to happen? How could someone be allowed to work 72 hours without sleep? Something is going to go wrong and yet it was a put down to a young man's determination to get on, which struck me as the wrong approach to the issue of his death. As I've spoken around New Zealand about the topic I'm about to move on to, I have been struck by the reaction. In some quarters there's been shock through unawareness. There has been doubt as to the accuracy or perspective which I advance, and I'm not an expert, but I draw only on evidence or conclusion to the Royal Commission. From others, the reservations about the message I'm conveying, particularly from some directors of companies who resist completely my proposition that directors have no severance from the workplace, they can have no absolute reliance on their senior managers, they must understand their business and they must be part of the business to know and check whether the performance of those senior managers they employ is up to mark. You take from what I say, what you will. But on a positive note, I have seen in the responses from many a determination to address the human failures to interact and human behaviour which founds my informal and uneducated thesis. New Zealand is now about to embark on a process which comes to a legislative end in 2014, December, if all goes well. There will be a new WorkSafe Crown Regulator as Pike River's Royal Commission recommended. There will be a representative body for health and safety professionals, and all this largely is based on the Australian model law. The primary duty of care will be on the responsibility of persons conducting a business or undertaking, and that's pretty well everything except a voluntary organisation where there is no remuneration. There will be a new due diligence duty on directors and officers, who must take active steps to manage their organisation's health and safety performance. 
The penalties, and I'm not a proponent of penalties as a way to achieving health and safety compliance or advancement, look like being for a simple breach of a duty, uh, an individual up to 100,000, serious harm, 300,000, corporate something more, reckless or intentional conduct, 600,000, five years imprisonment, and um, they're looking to see, the government's considering whether manslaughter should include an offence of corporate manslaughter. Now I sometimes hear and read all this and I, I applaud it, but I just wonder, this is the response of government, we've got to absorb this and the structure will start to roll out, but how is it going to change behaviour of people? Because people don't change. We don't change. We can learn and we can try and change our ways, but we can't actually change the very human responses that led to the failures at Pike River, and I will acknowledge them. And this will take some time. But even now, the Crimes Act provides for culpable homicide, including murder, in respect of omissions without lawful excuse to perform or observe any legal duty. And the Crimes Act provides, uh, in section 156, a duty on a person who has in charge or under control anything whatever, including operation of anything which in the absence of precaution or care may endanger human life, then a legal duty is raised with criminal responsibility for the consequence of omitting to perform that duty. And this has been a shadow over Pike River since the outset. For the reasons I'm going to come to shortly, the gas levels at Pike River were in an explosive range for nearly six weeks on 14 occasions before the explosion on the 19th of November. And not once did any person, any person in management or otherwise, consider it in terms of the record we have available. If they did, they said nothing about it. And these men went to work every day, therefore into a mine which fell in the explosive range which is between 5 and 15% of methane in the mix, as they call it, on those occasions. And I keep coming back to this, and the families keep coming back to it. How could this be? How could New Zealand allow a mine to operate like this with death, with explosion in the face of everyone who went down there on all those occasions, yet no one know about it? Something has gone very wrong not just in the system, but with the people. And this is gas that's not measured by a handheld machine, which most all workers have available on the ships and the sections of the mine they work in, virtually all, all the workers. This is measured by a gas monitor in the mine at three, at four strategic places, measuring the gas that comes down the return out of the mine, which you understand that the ventilation of the mine is in and out, and the return air contained these explosive measures of gas on these occasions before the 19th of November 2010, <coughs> the day of the explosion. That is reported to a control room on the surface. Of those four sensors, three were not functioning. Two had gone out more than a month before, one had gone out before then, and the fourth wasn't in the mine, it was at the top of the ventilation shaft and it was measuring a diluted flow of, of air because of the dilution factor and it had to be recalibrated, calculated back to what the source of the gas was in the mine. And that's where we get our information about how much gas there was. So how could that happen when Harry Bell, the legendary former Chief Inspector of Mines, who was a central figure in this inquiry, said about the Chief Inspector's role, to which I'll come back. The first thing an inspector did going into a gassy coal mine was to say, show me your gas book. In the days that gas was read and recorded in a book, show me your book. And if there's anything there which tells you you've got a problem, the Chief Inspector would find out, and if he's got any concerns, he shuts the mine down. Day after day, the pike men not just the men who died, the other men and the other ships, other contractors, went down to that mine into those circumstances. 
And on the 17th of November, the gas hit a 7% level in the 5 to 15% range and thus explosive for 10 minutes. So an ignition source at that time would have blown the mine. Think about it. How could this be? How could we have come to such a pass that the company failed in this regard? Now, we don't know what people did know. We know what they didn't know because the men had no way of understanding what those gas levels were. This comes to a surface recorder. And we don't know what the surface recording actually said or who was monitoring it at the time. And when we started to probe these questions, of course, with witnesses, and only a few witnesses ever turned up at Fight River, only a fraction of the people we would like to have seen turned up because it would have gone for 10 years otherwise, they took what some of you know as the fifth and others of you will know as their right uh, not to self-incriminate. So we never got the answers to the questions we wanted to ask, such as, did you ever go into the control room to look at the gas readings? Don't know. Did you ever understand what the gas levels were? Don't know. But when we asked some of the directors, and indeed senior management, some of them, and they, and they did answer the question, if they knew where the sensors were, the answer was, don't know. Can you tell us anything about the gas level in the mine? Don't know. We rely on others to do it. My starting thesis, reliance. How could there be such reliance in the way that I'm about to explain? So uh, my thesis, I suppose, I, I have difficulty with this because I'm not an academic in this area, but um, I've advanced what I say are the core propositions around this. But there must be, amongst uh, of all the things I've mentioned, apart from the leadership, we have to look at this culture of reliance. Uh, on whom can we rely and who can rely on us? And I want to explain why straight away. The mantra of directors in New Zealand, and particularly at Pike River, has been, we employ the best people and let them get on with it. That's their job. Yet the fallacy is in that, what if that person fails? What if your CEO fails in a finance company or in a mine? How do you know the failure is occurring or might occur? You think about this. In your own workplaces, how do you know that the people you rely on to perform crucial roles are, going, are up to mark? And I, by that I mean a qualified one and actually up to mark on the day. Because one thing we know is that we have a culture of, con of concealment within us in that we can disguise the things that actually detract from our performance. And if I can tell a story against myself in this regard, because Pike River had some outstanding examples of people engaged to do things that just blow your mind, because they weren't suitable for the job. I'm going to come to this in a minute. Uh, particularly now, uh, and particularly in the last 15, 20 years, young people have been trained and developed an art of presentation which my generation were not. So applying for jobs now is culturally prescribed as to how you go about preparing your CV, how you'll present, people are trained. They go to, uh, to people who tell you how to present at interview and get by. The result is that people can fox you completely, absolutely fool you if you're the person doing the interviewing, and can disguise dramatic failures of performance that have occurred before. And Pike is this in spades. And I recall, um, with all the, the lack of subtlety of a man, on a four-man committee interviewing two women for a job in a Christchurch institution, to which, as I told the story before, the women who heard it have said, well, there is one of the most stupid constructs we can imagine, that four men would interview two women to make a choice about employment. And so we interviewed two women for this important job. Uh, one was to say the least vivacious uh, and quick-witted 
um, and altogether, I suppose, in her own way, um, quite compelling. The other was calm, quiet, dignified, and was difficult to get much out of. So guess who we chose? It was a complete disaster. We were completely fooled by the, by the application, by the interview, and the point is that we people are fooled by the interview and the background processes which go to crucial employment. What happened at Pike River was this, a picture of what is called a hydro monitor. Most of you as engineers will have some understanding of this. This is a hydro monitor machine which is blasting coal using a water, uh, effectively a water cannon, and it sweeps across the mine creating a cavity and the coal is washed down, sluiced back out of the mine, a pike river would go right out of the mine, right down to a, um, a processing plant some distance away. And it's not like a big coal cutter that they had in other parts of the mine or a continuous miner. It's quite a business and it's not common and it carries very significant risk because what it does is that it cuts the coal and it releases the methane in the coal body. And the methane, being lighter than air, rises to the cavity which it creates. You can see something of this here. And at Pike River, the cavity grew and grew till it was holding, they estimated, 5,000 cubic metres of methane. Now methane's the game in a mine. Miners might have accidents. They might be hurt by machinery, but it's methane in the mix of air in that 5 to 15 percent range that causes the explosive setting. So we have a hydro monitor and it's not been done at Pike River which is a new mine. And so who do they engage as the coordinator for this mine? They engage a man called George Mason, an Australian. Now George Mason's history was this, twice in the, what's called the Maurer mine disasters in Australia he was named implicated for failures of performance. He left the industry for 11 years. He came back to this job to break in the hydro monitor system at Pike River which began in September 2010. In other words, two months before the explosion. And it creates this, and he has no experience with a hydro monitor at all, and no training effectively whatsoever. How did he get that job? How did he actually get past what should have been lines of inquiry, communication about his skill sets? And yet he was in charge, along with a Japanese gentleman known as Oki, Mr Nishioka, whose evidence the Royal Commission was after a month, he had to leave the mine, he was supposed to tell people how to operate this hydro monitor because he believed the mine was going to blow up. And yet this is put on the charge of a man who has this record that was described, described to you. How could that happen? And this from a company that said, we engage the right people for the job. Okay, reliance, can you rely? Has the person got the qualifications? And not just this man, George Mason, who was here, but on other occasions at Pike River, which I will not detail now, other people were employed who should never have been there of mine given their previous work history and failures. How could it happen? The culture of reliance. And before I just go into some of the specifics uh, of Pike River, I want to just say this to those who do not see the analogy of Pike with other places. I looked elsewhere to see if I could prove my thesis that Pike is really an example of what happens in many, many areas. And I came to an unlikely one when I read the report of the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards in the United Kingdom, which came out this year. It reported on the history of Halifax Bank of Scotland. And some of you may be aware of it. It was the merger of Halifax Building Society and the Bank of Scotland to make the big four banking group in the UK the big five. It went down for £41 billion. Now when the report was made by the commissioners, I thought this seems to be just like Pike. Uh, everything I read here is stuff I heard at Pike and in the Royal Commission report. It was a bank that grew furiously and massively. 
But these are some of the features that were found. And I reckon I can see this in some of the workplaces which I've been involved in. Firstly, when things went a bit dark and the world started to change in 2007, 2008, people were running for the doors, but not Halifax Bank of Scotland. Their culture they described as leaning against the wind, lending through the cycle, commit to customers even in tough times. Some people look as though they're losing their nerve beginning to panic even in today's testing environment, but not us. Think about that. That is self-delusion. What do the directors know? Directors said, we believed, and my colleagues always believed, they had a good understanding of the risks we were taking, and the bank had no evidence to the contrary. If there's an expression which makes my blood boil, it is that. We had no evidence to the contrary. The question and answer should be, what is the evidence that things are right? Not. There is no evidence to the contrary. That this mantra came out over and over at Pike River from witnesses. Why should you be pointing the finger at us? Why should you be inquiring of us? We had no evidence to the contrary. To which our, my short answer was, how could you? Because you had no evidence of any kind at all. And this was their answer. And in the uh, Halifax case, uh, we have other similarities, the turnover of officers, and this feature which I think is rather important. Uh, health and safety has never been regarded as a high-end occupation professionally in New Zealand. Perhaps it is now, but historically it has not had the status and reward that it should have. And this bank was one of those. The people came for three months, four months, and moved on. And health and safety is a crucial function in every workplace. These people had no status. They rolled through the Halifax Bank of Scotland uh, in very short order, regarding it as a career opportunity. But the board, the board said, and these are senior directors in the United Kingdom, Sir Ronald Garrick, by far and away the best board I ever sat on. Openness, transparency, high intellect, integrity, good working relationships, suitable diversity of backgrounds, mix of experience, etc. Uh, constant challenge. And this is what the Commissioner said, and I reckon Pike could carry this metaphor. The corporate governance of HBOS, Halifax Bank of Scotland, serves as a model for the future, but not as Lord Stevenson and other board, former board members saw it. It represents a model of self-delusion, of the triumph of process over purpose. The board, in its own words, abrogated and remitted to the management the formulation of strategy for which it should have been responsible. They did not have sufficient expertise amongst HBOS's top management. They were incapable of even understanding the risks that some elements were running, let alone managing them. And this, and I think this is a great little expression, we are shocked and surprised that even after the ship has run aground, so many of those who are on the bridge still seem so keen to congratulate themselves. Now, it's a great, great line, but a Pike River when I asked the question of the chairman and a senior manager, if things now, surely, they realised what was wrong, the answer was they'd have done things just the same. And it doesn't really require a submission or response to that. So who can you rely on? I am a huge opponent of if you like, a simple documentary system as something on which you can rely. And yet time and time again, we see the comment now in reports of failure of a belief that completing the forms, following the processes, is sufficient. And it's almost a doctrinaire approach to it. Fill in your forms, create what you need to do for a system of safety or otherwise, make sure you've got the forms in, they're signed off, and you're doing your job. Well. A very important report was made in Australia, uh, and it said this just a, a few years ago, about risk assessments. The operators became so accustomed to the risk analysis, they lost sight of its purpose. They underestimate the risk or simply fill out the form without giving it sufficient thought. This may lead to potentially threatening risk to be overlooked. This is a particularly vexing problem in most industries. How does one motivate a person on the front line to fill out yet another form when the risks are not necessarily evident or probability of injury may not be fully understood. You don't get the drive to comply with the system that's set up 
unless you understand why it is you're doing it, is the message from that report in Australia into mining. And when I, in my legal career, engage experts to assist with evidence and cases, we're often looking for some kind of validation of our client's position. And this is the ultimate, I think. I find this, I hope you find this as instructive as I do. It was obvious from the beginning that the New Zealand inspectorate uh, through the Department of Labor had failed dramatically. And in many respects, in most respects, it was not the failure of the inspectors because they were so neutralized by the de-emphasis on their role through the government's lack of funding, lack of concentration and recognition of the expertise required for an inspector to do their job, that these people simply had no opportunity. There was only one inspector of mines for the whole of New Zealand for three months in 2010. <coughs> Uh, in 2011. Only one, North Island and South Island. They themselves said, how can we do our job? We don't have the funds, we don't have the people, we don't have the training. How can we do our job? This is the warning that Harry Bell, the legendary inspector, gave to the government in 1997. And I think it's worth looking at this is written to the Honourable Max Bradford, and before anyone sees politics in, the, in, the, uh, in my presentation, that National Government Minister, I think of Chris Trotter, the political commentator, who after Pike and after his reading of the report said in a headline about Pike Rivers and the government's role in Pike, they, none of them can say anything. No administration of whatever colour can say anything. They have, in his words, they had in his words, blood on their hands because the government changed the law around the way the mines were conducted and inspected despite the warnings you'll see in this letter because you may not be able to read it I'm going to read this to you this was a letter written to the minister in 1997 to say you're changing the law don't let the ministry of the mines inspection group go to the labor department uh, he refers to his role as the inspector of coal mines and he talks a bit on that page about it on the next page, he says, um, with regard to the legislation that's come down, in the fourth paragraph, because of his background, the mines inspector was always called on to make judgment uh, in certain areas that may have been contrary to the regulations. This was not given lightly, and hard and fast rules were drawn up to safely achieve the solution. From what I've read in the papers, the Labor Department inspectors thrive on prosecutions and stopping jobs rather than offer advice to solve the problem. This, the mines inspectorate were created in the previous century due to the atrocities that occurred in mining and any weakening of this necessary historic act would not be in the best interest of safety. This from a man who is, was revered even then as an expert in his area. It was ignored, mining had its no, did not have its specialty uh, place as aviation did and it fell into the broad group uh, within the Department of Labor with the inspectorate system I've described to you. Well, as you might imagine, when the Royal Commission got hold of this, it slammed it. It said, the sad reality is that the department's performance has been so poor at strategic and operational levels, the department lost industry and worker confidence. So, a complete failure. But what do we get? In the middle of Pike River, we're presented with a report made by two Australian experts commissioned by the department to appraise their performance. I want to play you this interview by one of the authors uh, on Radio New Zealand. And listen carefully because it's got, a, it's got a, a bite at the end. We look at the inspection of this bit of equipment. We want to know now what other things you are doing. For instance, are you conducting regular dust uh, clearances? Dust in coal mines is a very big danger. And so we want to see the procedures on that. We also want to see the readings from your methane detection equipment to check that what you're telling us, it matches what's on the data. So we thought that they were good in that way. The two inspectors who were primarily involved at Pike River were themselves very experienced miners and New Zealand was actually pretty lucky to be able to have such experienced people. And then they called up other resources to double check what the mine was proposing in its procedures to deal with 
with methane, with the type of explosives that were going to be used in the mine and things of that sort. So we thought that the level of scrutiny was skilled and experienced. So you so, saw no one particular example where you thought, my goodness, the inspectors should never have allowed that to happen? No, we did not, no. Uh, we thought both in the <clears throat> in the number of visits that occurred to that mine by the inspectors and in the quality of the information that was exchanged and the quality of the, the debate between the mine and the inspectors when there were issues of difference, we thought that that was all very positive. Surprising, then, that things went so horribly wrong. Um, well, <laughs> to put it very crudely, shit happens. Sometimes things do go horribly wrong. Now, if you relied, as plainly the department did, on a report such as that from two significant health and safety experts in Australia, what does that tell you? It tells you that reliance on the fact you engage an expert is not the answer for you because you have to engage, one, the right expert, they probably did, two, that person must be resourced and informed as necessary, and these people weren't, and to a degree they acknowledged that, and thirdly, you rely on that at your peril. To take a view expressed as he did in the last part of that interview is such an insult, in my view, to what occurred here and a failure to recognise the problem that translate this to a workforce, a workplace, and you ask someone to come in and audit. If they are not really up to scratch, that audit is not worth anything. And that's what I mean by reliance. Can you rely? on the people you do rely on. And so Colin Espiner on the Sunday Times this week referred to deregulation's unfortunate uh, experiment and while it's characteristically uh, slender on fact, uh, it is and journalistically um, put to uh, sharpen the reader's interest. Uh, he talked about New Zealand's um, regulated economy uh, when the Longy government came in and David Longy likening it, us to us a Polish shipyard and the Fourth Labour Government setting about dismantling it. Now this is exactly what Max Bradford was on about as well, so there's no political arrow to be fired by me in this, in this um, criticism of the theory of light-handed regulation is that in a, in a market economy everyone's incentivised to do the best possible job for the lowest price or they won't succeed Government should stand aside. It only complicates things and gets in the way. It's taken 20 years, as Espen has said, for the magnitude of the stupidity of those reforms to come home to roost. It's taken Pike River to jolt New Zealand out of the complacency in which we have lived for all that time. And in my view, a significant attribution of the reason that the men at Pike River died. Think of the finance companies. Think of the lack of regulation around the way finance companies have operated, an area in which I've been prosecuting for the last few years as well. It is horrific to look at the record and the skills of the people in whom some of you have probably entrusted money. When it came to their sentence and their jail time, their defence was we didn't understand what we were doing. But they were taking in $180, $200 million from the public with guarantees which were not guarantees advertised in the paper. This was the product of our deregulated economy. And if I've been politicised by it and make it obvious, then I do make no apology for that because men died, people lost their livelihoods, people lost their wealth, they lost uh, most of what they'd built up over their lives in this period. So to conclude, I just want to summarise these key points out of Pike. One of the most crucial witnesses in the Pike River Inquiry was a man called Albert Holdham. He was a Barnsley miner, he was, he was a Yorkshire man through and through, he was in his 60s, he reached the view Pike River mine was going to blow and he left and went to New Guinea. He said the problem was there was no buddy system, there was no sense of teamwork in the mine, whereas he'd been trained in believing that you, the person next to you protected you and you protected that person, and by extension throughout the mine, that's what a mine is. He said, uh, my hair sticks up naturally because I have a crew cut, but I saw some things in there that would make it stand up naturally. How could they get away with that? It wasn't a planned operation. Everything was an independent unit. 
when you're working in such close proximity, you can't start messing with our ventilation the way they did. He made a big impression on the Royal Commission who endorsed what he said, the need for recognition you are part of a team. Secondly, I think there's five points I wish to make, it's astonishing to think when some of the key witnesses from the company were interviewed by the police and Department of Labor about what do you think when there's nothing from down the mine, there's no phone, there's no connection, there's no sound, there's no movement. You must have realized there was a something catastrophic had occurred. Well, no, we didn't think about that because that doesn't happen in modern mines. So if you don't understand what the risks might be, how can you address them? They never saw this happening. It's a bit like I was speaking to the port of, of Napier a few weeks ago, and I said, what's the worst thing that can happen here? Thinking of piles of logs coming down. What's the macro incident? And they said, a computer-controlled ship coming to this port which can't actually stop. Four days later, that is exactly what happened in Genoa, when a ship could not be stopped and it went into the wharf and into the control tower and four people were killed. So the, the risk had not been anticipated. How can you address risk unless you, you understand what that risk is? I have referred to the right people by way of qualification. I have referred to George Mason of the hydro mining. And I come ready, or in conclusion, to this. People may be engaged for the right reasons. They may be checked out very carefully. I have my own reason to believe that checking out is not a good system, is not well done. And this is a criticism of the, if you like, the whole approach to engagement of people when there's a shortage of skilled staff, as there is in Christchurch today, there's a shortage of people. So if people get taken on with scant inquiry as to their records and their skill sets. I'm not criticising engineers, who I'm sure will not fall for this one. But that's what's happening. And as a result, we have workplaces in Christchurch now which experts I'm speaking with and working with tell me are really dangerous places. Because we don't know who these people are. We don't know if they've got convictions for major, perhaps, work and safety incidents overseas. They're here. Do we have leadership? Uh, one of the mind managers, and I'm not here to personalise this address, was described as a megalomaniac. His way or the highway. That's not going to work. When the normal, abnormal becomes the normal, as it did at Pike, we're all in danger. And that can happen uh, in this way. And the question was asked, how and why competent people, when faced with balancing complex demands and competing objectives, underestimate and deny the significance of hazards in the workplace. This mine, if I had an hour, I could tell you the conditions under which the men worked. Uh, with an illegal egress, there was no second egress out of the mine that was effective. There was dislocation or severance in the system. There was no overarching view of safety. Were people on the same page? No, they were not. There were people from South Africa, people from other continents who came, there were language problems, there were disputes between people, there were jealousies as there are in any workplace. These things were at times in Pike uh, um, obvious to observers such as us. But finally, when it comes to the way the board uh, looked at this, I come back to the proposition which I think some of you did clearly register, is that the idea that the board of a company and everyone else represents the division of church and state has been laid to rest. The board of a company, the council of a university, the, 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 the controlling body of any organisation must know the game. They must know what is happening on the shop floor metaphorically. If they don't, they cannot actually appraise the risks that are run in the workplace. No gas mine experience on this board. So, if errors are a characteristic of all of us, which they are, um, how do we actually now respond? What do we do to change the way you go out tomorrow and work or employ people or perform your own duties? Because reliance is integral, I leave these questions with you. On whom do you rely and can you rely? And that first of all involves, are they up to the mark? Are they qualified? Can they do the job? And secondly, on the day, are they any good? And that means, in a dangerous occupation, are they ill? Are they exhausted? Are they going through relationship problems? Financial problems? Are they up to the mark? Because you've got to keep checking. You've got to have a system of appraisal. 
And secondly, can they rely on you? Are you up to the mark every day? I'm certainly not. I probably put my client files at risk. And I'll bet there are some in this room who, looking at yourselves, will recognise that we all have some shockers. Some days we fail in all sorts of ways, and some days we shouldn't be driving cars, certainly not riding bikes, because we're putting ourselves and others at risk. So this question of reliance, to me, is the theme I'm trying to convey. We're all workers and interdependent. There must be an understanding of mutuality, the importance of each of us one to the other. This is the recalibration of the attitude to safety I think is required. Make people feel important as individuals. Value yourself for the work you do because you know you do it well. Reward with recognition of performance. Look out for one another. We are imperfect and our standards vary. Our performance varies. And in a risk setting, we must look at and out for one another. This would be the best way to show respect for the 29 men who never returned home on the 19th November 2010 and for their loved ones. Thank you.